I'm pretty sure half of us took an Uber or Ola ride to come to the venue today, have ordered from Zomato. Um, urban company almost always comes to my rescue when there is a crisis at home, including last night when my AC broke down. So gig platforms don't need an introduction. They are touching all of our lives and all of, our, all of us living in urban India. But what we often don't discuss in forums like these are the lives behind these platforms, which are making these uh, platforms possible. There are approximately 3 million plus individuals who make up India's large, informal, thriving gig economy. And we clearly don't think of the workers uh, in that scale and in that number. And I would also say that gig work is not new for them. It's not as if they have not performed or called it with a different name. But yes, with the access of technology, with the growth of platforms like these, their participation in this work has increased uh, significantly. At the, Del at the Dell Foundation, creating opportunities for youth coming from underprivileged families, helping them achieve their aspirations is at the core of our mission and values. And we believe that the millions of young adults who are finishing college and school, this could be a way to help them enter and thrive in the future of economy. 85% of India's workforce employed through the informal sector, the use of these platforms can be can be great in terms of making the work more formal or actually increasing the transparency of labor demand and supply. With this in mind, we had commissioned a study to the Boston Consulting Group to understand what is the potential of uh, the gig work. And there are some interesting insights from this which I wanted to share before we launch into the platform. First is just the amount of economic value that it can generate to increase livelihood opportunities for low-income workers. The report estimates that the gig economy has the potential to service up to 90 million jobs in India's non-economic, non-farm economy alone, transact over USD 250 billion in volume of work, and contribute an incremental 1.25% uh, to India's GDP over the long term. The second thing which the report says is that uh, in order for this potential to be leveraged, Targeted offerings will be required to effectively engage and retain gig workers. And finally, we need an ecosystem approach, the kind of dialogue that we are having here today at Charcha, to be able to unlock the potential of gig economy for India. Therefore, in a forum like Charcha, which is discussing livelihoods, I think uh, to not have a discussion on this topic and what we can do uh, through, the, through the potential of gig economy in terms of whether we are achieving that potential or not, whether enough innovation is being done for the workers, and what more do we need to do, what more collective action is needed. Uh, I think that's a very important topic for our convening today. And I couldn't have asked for a more uh, knowledgeable panel than what I have today. So, so let me start with uh, you, Supriya. Supriya is the founder of Josh Talks, which has uh, 17 million plus subscribers on the platform. It's a platform where I think it's deep into the tier three and tier four towns and uh, just listening to the youth, listening to their aspirations. Uh, it's just a, it's a daily inspiration talk, at least uh, for me. So my question to you, Supriya, is that uh, what is your understanding of the aspiration of the youth entering the job market and uh, how attractive do they, do they find these uh, platform employment models? So I think, um, I mean, when we look at youth, we kind of have to categorize it into different segments because as we move from a tier one city to a tier two, tier three, tier four, and then we specifically look at uh, girls who are entering the workforce, the aspirations are different. Uh, but what we've at least seen in, you know, smaller towns and cities in India is that private job is not the first aspiration. So anyway, that's a tough battle to fight because the first order of aspiration is to get a government job. An average person in at least the hinterlands of UP and Bihar spends about five and a half years preparing for these government jobs. Uh, nine lakh of them give it for 900 seats. And when that doesn't happen and you reach an age where you now need to provide income for the family is when you start thinking of the second order of aspiration, which is a private job. When you look at a private job, what is uh, the, the thought process of a government job follows through. So you then aspire for a desk job, which means, you know, a place where you have a lot of security coming in. Uh, you feel safe in the work environment. You know that this is not something that's going to be cut off. And when that doesn't happen is when you move to the third order of aspiration, which is now I need to feed my family at home. Whatever I get, I'll do. 
Um, however, this changes in tier one India, where you also look at flexible work, where you look at freelancing, where you look at gig opportunities beyond delivery executives, but also as you know, uh, specialized skills. So, for example, we are uh, we have a large content production um, system. So, we also outsource a lot of work for freelancers for video editing and other such things. So, I think it changes drastically as you move from city to city, from language to language. Uh, but there is a lot of increased awareness that we need towards platform models because the safety or the security or the benefits that some of the models are providing and I was chatting with Gurpreet backstage uh, is that is something that audiences don't know of right now. So, you know, there's always this fear. Um, but for women, it's completely different. For women, I think there is still lesser adoption. There is also, you know, problems like mobility, safety, etc., which they have to care for. Um, and that's why there is still like a lot to be done in terms of building that aspiration for people to, uh, you know, want to use such platforms. So I think the more the more we make them feel secure about their job, which is the biggest fear, which is why government job is the biggest aspiration, the easier it will be for larger sets of audiences to adopt uh, platform models. Thanks, Supriya. But um, so one of the things I'm taking away from what you're saying is that it's almost looked upon as a last resort option uh, when we've tried everything. And then if nothing is working, then yes, this is an option. So maybe, uh, Gurpreet, you want to come in and share your thoughts on what your experience through Avigna has been, because Avigna is providing a variety of roles. It has, you know, 20,000 plus workers. Uh, doing all kinds of different and, uh, you know, what I think aspirational jobs also. So can you share your comments on this, please? Sure. Uh, first of all, thanks, Prachi, for having me here. Hi, everyone. This is Gurpreet. I'm the co-founder of Avigna. Uh, so to answer that question, uh, Prachi, see, we have over a million gig workers on our platform and 60% of them belong to this youth category of, uh, you know, 18 to 25. Now we have a fair idea about why they are coming to the platform. So I'll, I'll name a few usual suspects. Uh, they want to earn livelihoods for their family. Uh, they're trying to support the family because they're the sole bread earners. They are basically are not getting formal employment and then shifting to platform economy. Or they are basically having some formal education and at the same time, they want to quick some uh, quick bucks. Uh, but what I want to focus on, uh, Prachi, today is that what is driving them towards the platforms? The first factor here is that there is a very low entry barrier to platforms. And when I say low entry barrier, I mean uh, the eligibility is relaxed. Uh, there is flexibility on the job location. The duration of the uh, task at hand is flexible. And most importantly, the skill set required is lesser. So for example, uh, you know, back at Avigna, we have nine lines of business. And out of them, seven do not require any prerequisite skill set. Four of them do not even require, you know, any particular degree. So if we look at gig workers, they can hop onto the platform within a few days, they are able to start earning and make livelihood for their families. And I think that's what uh, the platform economy stands for today. And another point, Prachi, that I want to add is uh, a factor of flexibility that, you know, Supriya also mentioned. Uh, the natural flexibility that gig jobs give uh, uh, enables uh, gig workers to easily adopt the platform economy. So, and I'm talking about flexibility, not just on time and location, but also on the nature of the job that they can do and the ability to juggle between different jobs. So we have gig workers who start the day, uh, you know, doing audits for a marketing firm, and then they end the day doing telesales for a FinTech firm. So that's a variety of things they can do. They can create their own calendars. Uh, and, uh, you know, as a stat, 40% of our gig workers, uh, Prachi, are currently working on multiple roles at this point of time. So these two factors have contributed a lot to why the gig workers are getting affiliated uh, to the platform economy. Yes. Thanks, Gurpreet. I'll, I'll push that argument a little bit more with both Abhiraj and Mukul, because Mukul, as uh, the co-founder of the Pravega Funds, almost exclusively invests only in livelihoods. Uh, linked platforms and Abhiraj, of course, we all know is the pioneer of this work almost in India. And I would say that um, while flexibility is great and, you know, uh, you know, being able to fit it in your schedule is great, being able to do a job of your choice is great. At the, you know, at the bottom of it all, we want an increase on income, right? We want to have a progressive career pathway, the one which will get 
our youth in rooms like these or in conversations like these. And that's the true aspiration that we hold for the youth as well. And I agree that, you know, we are today offering many other benefits, but really do we have, do we have within our platforms the potential to be able to unlock that? And, and I'll, you know, where do you think, Abhiraj, we are delivering on that promise of uh, increase of income, creating an equi equity and opportunity through the platforms? And Mukul, if you'd like to go next. Thanks, Prachi, for having me. I think I'll start by saying that the gig economy in India is maybe seven or eight years old. And, um, you know, given the time frame that most platforms have existed for, um, I think we, I think it's a fairly decent place that they have managed to reach. If I think about, you know, four key parameters, uh, income, formalization around social security, safety, financing, etc. Um, long term career development and wealth creation. Let's just think about those four parameters. Uh, I think on the income parameter, you know, minimum wage is sort of the starting point that most platforms today have managed to uh, take care of. Um, as we think ahead, I think the tr sort of bridge has to be from minimum wage to living wage. So to put things in perspective, minimum wage in um, Delhi would be nearly 15,000 a month, but living wage would be closer to 26,000. And I think uh, as a youth who's, uh, you know, particularly for blue collar platforms, when you're coming into a city like Delhi, the minimum aspiration you would have is to be able to earn a living wage so that you can support a family, send kids to school, etc. So I think that's, you know, good starting point is that in a short span of seven to eight years, you all have, you have platforms that are all adhering to the minimum wage. In contrast with the informal economy where most of these workers are coming from, which is, you know, not... Uh, in compliance there, but I think now the next sort of goalpost is a living wage. I think as far as formalization is concerned, most platforms will have some kind of basic uh, insurances in place, be it life insurance or accidental insurance. I think the next step will be, uh, you know, healthcare uh, for all workers in the platform. Um, and that will ensure a, a minimum level of, of social security. Um, I think career development and wealth creation is the area where platforms have to apply their mind a lot more. Uh, you know, today, if you're a delivery agent, it's not like you have a career path where you can see yourself earning more and eventually growing. Uh, so that's one area of focus. Uh, and finally, wealth creation, you know, very few platforms, uh, the workers who are in some ways in, in shape and form creating these platforms and helping these platforms succeed, they are not partaking today in the wealth that is getting created. Uh, so if you put all of those four things together, I would say, you know, the first seven to eight years, um, I think we are at a, at a decent place. We've made a fair amount of progress for the short duration of time, but now we've reached a certain level and we have to imagine what the next uh, step jump is on each of those parameters for the platforms to take. Thanks, Abhiraj. Mukul, would you like next? And just listening to Abhiraj, I'll add that additional question for you is that you are also seeing newer companies and very early stage startups come into this, right? And which are learning from the ones which are already there. So when we think of social resilience, when we think of health insurance, when we think of, you know, all of the, uh, you know, creating a progressive pathway for them, are you seeing any innovations also happening, which, uh, which are with that mindset? Sure. Uh, so, uh the way I have seen this, we have been investing in India for last 10-15 uh, years and a lot of these gig platforms have start coming at the last toll, like 2010-2011 when Zomato, food delivery, e-commerce, uh, mobility is becoming big and then we saw next level of company creation in from like urban company and then there are many more uh, new set of initiatives are getting taken. When I marry that with the kind of need for the gig platforms or for the for the gig workers or for that demographic demographic segment i see two broader buckets uh, one is a income highway and second is a social security highway and when i say so social security highway it's pretty much catch all like education training uh, insurance because that income highway is with lot of potholes and the moment you bump into any pothole you get derailed and then you need to get back get get the guy back on back on that highway so i still think and and echo that same sentiment that 
lot of progress on the income highway and i think now there are good critical mass where next level of innovation and next level of progress is happening on that income highway but that social net is still a missing part and uh, when i see big companies uh, which is like now urban companies big zomato is big swiggy is big and when i see smaller companies big companies are still doing something but still it's a basic thing smaller companies are not able to do anything because those products are not available their ability to invest into those products are not available so i think that journey is just starting it'll be another 7 8 years when we'll see lot of uh, and and lot of ecosystem things needs to happen to make that journey successful so we just started seeing those 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 things uh, in a, it's it's a very first and a small step in that direction that's a great thought and let's come back to the point that uh, both of you are raising about uh, this social highway and uh, social security highway and what needs to be done what big companies can do uh, in terms of setting the precedent as well as they have the ability to now and what the small companies can do so let's come back to that question but since we are having a lot of discussion today on skilling and uh, especially aspirational skilling um i would love to get thoughts maybe from all three of you gurpreet mukul and abhiraj uh on uh, you know we are saying 3 million plus workers are employed in this do you think they enter the work the gig workforce with that readiness which they need in order to enter it i don't know with from a digital literacy perspective from an ability perspective understanding it and uh, and i know in particular much some of the service oriented platforms like yours abhiraj there's a there's a big before after i'm sure that you're seeing in your workers so so if you will talk a little bit about what is the gap you're seeing and what is it that the skilling ecosystem can do today to fill that gap uh, i think it will be very informational for the audience to go back and think about it in their respective work sure prachi so for us you know we have around 42000 service professionals on our platform today i would say the first 5 to 10000 was relatively easy and straightforward to onboard they had a good hygienic level of skill and the role we played was more of a finishing school uh, to polish some of the last mile skills and some of the soft skills as we went from 10000 workers to about 30000 workers we started to see that we had to invest more heavily in upgradation of core skills so our training programs which were earlier maybe 5 days or 6 days started to become 15 days or 20 days long um now at about 42000 workers almost 40 to 50% of the people who are joining our platform today um do not have a background in that particular industry for so for example half of our beauticians who are joining are not beauticians prior to joining the platform and they are undergoing an intensive two month training program at one of our 300 plus training centers um at our own expense and are then becoming high quality beauticians and entering the platform um one of the things i've realized is that the skilling uh you know for good or for bad the overall quality of of skilling in the country is uh, is relatively weak and there's a very sharp fall after the first you know 2 3 4 5% um and so i almost take it as a given that uh for platforms to become successful and truly large they have to invest in the skilling ecosystem uh whatever their you know respective field of choosing is and without that investment um you know you almost cannot scale and provide for quality to the end consumer so you know for us for example we have now nearly 300 uh training centers we have 400 full time trainers on our on our payroll um we have created original and unique pedagogy across all the different categories that we have any month we're training 5 to 6000 workers uh both new as well as ongoing and several of those 400 trainers come from our own workforce you know our best performing uh, service professionals who climb the ladder and eventually become trainers so uh, i think it's an important investment uh, that that platforms have to make and do you think it is becoming a bottleneck for your expansion uh, in terms of availability of the skilled workforce it's the single biggest rate determining factor for our growth today and it is also the single biggest cost line item in my pnl so almost 30 to 40% of our cost base is into training uh and 
the rate at which we can add high quality service professionals pretty much determines the rate at which urban company can grow wow thank you thanks abhiraj gurpreet mukul would you like to add um sure uh, so prachi uh, if we look at the ecosystem today it's uh, certainly deprived uh, there is a lot less people who are formally trained uh no now you know what i think what uh, the uh, uh, approaches to the skilling ecosystem is there is one approach where there are pure skilling companies uh, such as you know josh talks who will not guarantee a job or a placement but they will make sure that the person is trained uh, to the extent they have to be then there are other companies who will invest in a resource uh, bring them up to speed train them and then absorb them or place them elsewhere i think there is no right or wrong here both the approaches work uh, what we believe in is a third approach which is about on the job training and then continuous upskilling happening on the hand you know side by side uh, so what i mean here is that the gig workers should be matched to the skill sets uh, they have and the opportunities that are available for those skill sets once they start the work once they're trained on that work once they make some living out of it is when the focus should be on upskilling now this skilling should uh, you know ensure that these gig partners will stick to those platforms they will grow with those platforms and this has worked very well for us uh, you know i've seen gig workers who started as delivery agents with a platform today they are doing high skill jobs they are they are doing sales for certain companies as well so this is what the platform economy should focus on uh, uh, when it comes to you know skilling one thing i think which uh, we all can improve on as an ecosystem is that there is a lack of formalized certification for gig work uh, i don't see that as much because it's not very well defined so as a framework we should invest in creating such uh, certifications for gig work at avigna we've launched avigna university as an initiative uh, to tackle this uh, we hope to add a lot of content and courses uh, which can help you know uh, the career development of gig workers over a, a period of 2 to 3 years and the other thing i think that uh, our ecosystem can improve on is a lack of feedback mechanism uh, which can be linked to the appraisal of gig workers so you know as uh, abhiraj mentioned for gig workers there is no growth path so if we can build some kind of an appraisal system and link it to the feedback then the incentives i think it will work well uh, and it will uh, relate closely to the skilling Uh, that the gig workers have those are both excellent points because i was i don't know whether gorov from the xstep team is in the audience or not um but that's a big conversation that a lot of first of all like the appraisal feedback type of history because of which repeat businesses etc happen and you know it's a worker history almost stays with a platform but uh, the other point you raise about the digital certificate skill certificate is something which we just need at an ecosystem level and uh, and is much you know i also know that the you know there is a big team which is working on it so it's a great idea mukul did you want to add anything i have more questions than answers <laughs> on skilling and uh, we keep thinking about it because we are a for profit venture fund and anywhere if we want to make money then we keep want to think about it and as what gurpreet is saying it's right that skilling roi is very clear when it is relatable to a job and we i know i'll skill it trainer for a beautician job for let's say take some cost of some bug then i'll get make out of it and that's very very easy and clear to do it but challenge with that is ki it's dependent on four or five platforms if they become big they'll skill if they don't become big then uh then there is no skilling so as a country we are getting hold by five or 10 of platforms who are becoming big uh and at the other hand we see lot of early stage companies who are not able to invest in scaling because simply they don't have money and that roi is not clear so somewhere that confusion is there that are we missing on because for profit equation is not at least visible on paper it may work but it's not visible today and hence for profit capital is not coming in so we keep thinking about it lot of contradictions in our head in that direction uh, where to invest and not to invest but these are we should not depend on 10 platforms scaling then uh, because then we are saying that as a country the gig force scaling is dependent on 10 platforms which is not somewhere fair conclusion to the people of the nation 
So yeah, absolutely. I said we have more questions than answers <laughs> here. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think that's the debate today because, you know, there is a, like Abhiraj is also saying, we've gotten to a point and it's a good point. I mean, at least the skills which were available in the market have been matched. But, you know, there is immense potential. And if we have to cross to the next stage of unlocking the 90 million from the 3 million that we are at, uh, there are significant bottlenecks. There is an ROI question. And, uh, and how much will we do as platforms and how much should all of us do as ecosystem players is, is really the debate. And it'll be great to get your thoughts, Supriya, because you started as a platform where you were just listening to the aspirations of the youth. And then you have now, you know, gone on to launch Josh Skills, which is actually meeting some of that aspiration as well. So, so do you want to come in at this point and talk about that? So I think um, the problem that we identified with something like skilling was that people weren't able to see light at the end of the tunnel. So there was not, there wasn't like an intrinsic will that I want to upskill myself. I want to learn something new, which is going to get me a job at the end of it. So we decided to tackle the problem in a different way where we said we'll solve for aspiration and inspiration first. Where we'll show you that if you work at an, at an urban company and I'm, I'm a big fan and I use it. Uh, what is going to happen over the period of two to three years, which is why I think career development and something everyone's spoken of is very, very important. Because when you're able to see that 15,000 income going to 20,000, 25,000 or 30,000, you're able to then, you know, inspire others to take that journey in life. So, for example, like we worked with Swiggy and I think one thing interesting that came out of that entire journey while working with them was they had a couple of people who were delivery executives who moved into delivery fleet management and then they had like an upgradation program which made them get a desk job, which is aspirational. So when people were seeing those stories online of people moving up that ladder or rank um, and getting a desk job, it made it more, you know, aspirational to start at an entry level because you know what the outcome is going to be. When you don't know what the outcome is going to be and you fear what the outcome is actually going to be is when you take a step back. So we're kind of doing our bit where we're saying that, okay, if you learn XYZ, here is a growth chart for you. And here are some people who've already done that and they're like you. They come from your background and look at where they've reached now. And then we're kind of marrying the two by also providing that service of skilling so that you, you watch a high-intent video, you get motivated, you get inspired, you know what the outcome will look like and then you're able to make that purchase to actually do the same. So there is a very real linkage to defining and almost putting in the form of a person that this is who you could be. This is what their path has been and you know these are the skills you need and I think that's where maybe some of our uh, skilling answers are Mukul that um, at least I feel that you know when you're skill whenever you're skilling or learning or you know educating yourself you're looking for that very real outcome out of it uh, which will come out and you know how do businesses actually convert that into something which will meet the aspirations in a real way. Right. I mean, one thing is to just, uh, you know, be able to offer a course, but the real deal is to be able to offer a job at the end of it. And I think that's what that's what I think their initial trust and immediate trust almost on gig platforms is because you get you do something and you get paid for it. You learn something and you get paid for it. And, you know, you're talking about moving it uh, one step further. OK, then I'm going to ask one common question to all of you and uh, come back to the topic of this convening overall, which is about worker resilience. And some of it is naturally built in to the nature of the gig platforms just by giving it that transparency, that uh, uh, schedule almost, that visibility into what their work will look like. Um, but as you look at not just yourself but other companies as well, what are the different things that you think are getting done and can be done to further build that uh, resilience in workers uh, from a social security benefits perspective? from any other uh, angle that you see of training of a progressive pathway what are some of the things which can be done or are getting done because a vigna i know provides a variety of roles to be sure sure uh, uh, no i think that's a very important uh, discussion praji because that's something that uh, in the last couple of years uh, we've been all debating about how do we uh, make this from an income highway to a social uh, security highway and, and that's a question that we all uh, you know keep asking so I think one solution there is uh, at least for the res resilience part of it that uh, there should be communities which should be built for the gig workers now what happens is that all the gig workers are alienated in a way and they feel isolated so if there is a, a community that is able to guide them provide counseling provide mentoring uh, it solves a lot of their 
issues and addresses their concerns so that's one the second is you know i'll i'll address the elephant in the room which is the social security code uh, you know which has come up uh, in the last couple of years we all know it's a very great step it's a step in the right direction and will will uh, make this ecosystem thrive but there are certain challenges which are associated with it at this point of time and we have to overcome them uh, you know sooner so uh, the first challenge is that a lot of this will take a lot of time to implement at the grassroots level uh, for example there are certain social schemes today which are not relevant for the nature of gig work today that we have we have per task mandates we have per hour mandates we have per project mandates but the schemes that we have are not really mapping uh, to that particular requirement so it is important that all of us all the stakeholders come together to design a framework specifically designed for gig work which is missing at this point of time so uh, you know as abhiraj also mentioned uh, we are already doing insurances we have started early wage access back at avigna and we are also launching a couple of uh, pension schemes but i think we can do more uh the second challenge uh, prachi which is associated with this particular topic is the gig gig workers themselves are a little apprehensive towards this social security benefit uh the reason is obvious they want payout in hand rather than a long term benefit so it is important as we we as an industry educate them that in the long run this is what wealth creation will be this is what will solve all your adversaries not your uh, in hand payment so these are the things i think uh, as a community we can work towards uh, to make it a better social security sort of a platform uh, which the gig economy is currently not great happy raj did you want to add or mukul i can go back to the four pillar framework prachi that i was talking about so let me let me and and talk about what we are doing at urban company so on social security uh we have a commitment to life accidental and health insurance for all our workers in india so all of them enjoy a life and accidental cover of 6 lakhs and a health insurance cover of 1 lakh and a certain uh certain class of our workers who are high performing also get a family health cover worth 2 lakhs which covers your spouse and two kids uh, and that we feel is a bare minimum and we've seen very very good reception particularly to the health uh insurance uh in light of the pandemic and what all has happened in the last two years uh the second thing i think is around just access to credit uh access to uh you know a personal loan when you need one access to a vehicle loan a home loan that also uh we've seen uh you know being very well received because otherwise if tomorrow they have the aspiration of building a home uh you know you go to a bank the bank will ask for your form 16 the bank will ask for a whole variety of salary slips etc otherwise it's very difficult for you to get a home loan at the right uh, interest rate so the ability to partner with the right set of banks and nbfcs and be able to streamline that entire process um i think uh, is helpful and then at our end to use the data and to use the uh, the payout system that we have to give the creditor the confidence that uh, you know it's a low risk um, a loan from their side as well so that's one on social security uh, on the career pathing i think we've we've particularly made it a point to invest in a way that uh, the service professional can see at least two or three levels and with each level upgradation they see an income upgradation eventually becoming a trainer on the platform uh, and that we've seen uh, you know just creates an aspiration uh, alignment with what the platform wants wealth creation uh, you know i don't know if if you're aware but we had earlier this year launched a 150 crore partner stock option plan uh, and this was sort of our attempt to see if our service professionals can can participate in the wealth creation that the platform is doing uh, this is i think a new area where we will also learn as we go along um finally uh, you know it all comes back to income uh and the ability to uh you know make a living wage and earn well um and there i think you know the more transparency that can be created in the ecosystem around uh you know what workers are earning the better it is for workers um there we've taken a step earlier this year to uh, launch something called the urban company partner earnings index where every quarter we uh, very transparently publish what do uh service professionals earn uh depending upon how much time they spend on the platform um and that's just a way for us to hold ourselves accountable 
uh, to a certain minimum red line of earnings that we want to commit uh, to our service professionals. Well, that's great because it's not just wage and earning, and but you know, earning it with dignity, with the transparency that uh, all of us deserve when we work is um, is is a special ability, I think, which the tech platforms have. And connecting to you know what you said earlier, both you and Gurpreet said earlier about the immense amount of worker data on their performance, on their history. You know, if, if today they are sitting with platforms, but if there were ecosystem initiatives which could actually take it out one step and link it to access to credit, uh, that's something which uh, which can go a long way in terms of their own progression and their own micro entrepreneurship or whatever the next step is uh, for them. Mukul, did you want to add anything uh, on this question? No. Okay, great. Then I'll ask one concluding question and ask the organizers if we have time for audience question. Um, is the role of philanthropy in in this work right? Today we are uh, today we are you know you are all well funded companies you know uh, doing actually quite well, and you know there is just a participation I think of uh, so some form of social capital but also lots of commercial capital which is working with it. Yet we are all working for a workforce that, you know, through different forms, we are trying to either skill, place, match. So, uh, but yet I haven't seen many uh, partnerships or large partnerships with philanthropy in this in this space. So at, uh, you know, in a forum like this, it'll be an amiss if I don't ask you for your ideas on what could we do? What could we do more? What if you want, if you thought that, you know, there was a role for philanthropy CSR to play in this? So definitely there is a role for uh, philanthropy to work with the uh, for-profit capital and uh, I think that catalytical capital is very, very important. When we are transitioning from a income, like we have done first step uh, in a branch framework and then we need to do three, four other things and a lot of like access to capital, access to capital, access to credit is a very basic uh, uh, deed and I have seen a lot of failure because that last 10% is not justifiable from a for-profit perspective. And the catalytical capital have definitely played a role in the MFI journey for last 20 years. Initial two, three years, four years, five years, there's a lot of catalytical capital came and then proof got happened and then it is scaled up. So that catalytical capital role, either on the security side, insurance side, access to credit side is, is if it works with for-profit, uh, both of them together, that can be very uh, interesting for next uh, seven, eight year of progress in this path. Um, so there are a couple of points uh, which I think you know philanthropy uh, organizations can can be partnered with. Uh, so one thing is that see all philan philanthropic organizations are catering to a specific group of individuals, be it specially able folks or be it you know marginalized women from tier three towns. Now if platforms can come together with these organizations, target a specific set of individuals, then spend that capital and effort to bring them at par with the others, you know, in terms of skills, in terms of uh, uh, the, the opportunities. I think that would be an important sort of a partnership, which would be very clinical in nature. So there could be targeted use of these funds and, uh, you know, eventually it would, it would help the ecosystem. Uh, the other piece uh, is also about, you know, using this capital uh, to discount the credit uh, line that gig workers can get. So today they're not able to get a lot of loans. Uh, if the NBFCs can collaborate with philanthropic organizations to discount that rate of interest, uh, I think that could help. But there the important point would be uh, how will this data of platforms be used? Uh, you know, the historical data that you mentioned, uh, how can that be, you know, made as a standard framework to judge whether this gig worker is credit worthy or not? Mm -hmm. So that would be an open debate point maybe for the next discussion. Thanks, Vicky. So Priya, do you want to add? I think the outcome of something like skilling is an economic opportunity. It's a for-profit opportunity. But whenever we look at skilling, we look at it from a not-for-profit lens. So I think one of the things that we've seen or, you know, organizations like us who are working in the skilling space is that we work with super, like, lower-income households below 25,000 rupees, right? And even then, we are relying on them paying up. So even for us on our app, we have 5% people who purchase a 500 rupee basic course and the 95% of people who don't, most of them can't because they can't even afford that 500 rupees. But whenever we've looked at organizations partnering with us, they don't look at partnering with a for-profit for skilling, they would rather go with a not-for-profit. 
But at the end of the day, we are investing in technology to ensure that people are completing that skilling course so there is an outcome. So I think that's where a, a greater role of collaboration can come in, where philanthropic capital is being used for an economic outcome and not seen as a not-for-profit outcome. That's a great point. Aviraj, did you want to add anything? Uh, do, I don't know, do we have time for uh, audience Q&A? We do. Are there any questions in the audience? Yes, please. We have to uh, you know, distinguish between jobs and livelihood. And livelihood gig is livelihood, right? Okay. So I just want, it's a very esteemed panelist and I'm really happy to hear all of you. What is your view? If these two things combine, you know, because we are looking at livelihood in the interior, in the rural, in the thing. I think this can be a game changer because when you're working from home, right, it changes everything. For women especially, right, which is there, you know, because we have done some surveys and women prefer to work from home. Let the, and they have to be given a choice, definitely. Go out for work or work from, let the work come to your home. What is your view about these two things combined and how it's going to be a game changer? So one is around rural and... See, I'm just saying, uh, combine gig and work from home opportunities, how can it be a game changer? So I can share an anecdote here and thank you for the question. Uh, so uh, we are aware of this gig worker who used to uh, work in a telesales job. She used to visit the office and come back. But she had to discontinue the work because uh, she had a young kid, you know, she had, and she had to take that responsibility. Uh, that stopped her career. But because of the work from home opportunities that we have, so we have content operations, uh, telecalling, exam invigilation, she was able to get back to her career and she was actually the star performer for us in the last month. So she earned 50,000 a month in that particular a month. So, so you know, uh, you're right, with, with work from home, there is an added flexibility and there is an added uh, comfort that you can still make your livelihood and manage your home. because. Today in, in India, there is still this cultural uh, uh, stereotype that, you know, women cannot work. But this is changing, right? And, and uh, for us also, during COVID, uh, we used to be a field-driven platform. Uh, work stopped for a day, you know, and it happened for all of us. But we were able to add a lot of remote lines of businesses. And now we have grown, you know, 10x from them. That was the major factor. Hi. Hi. Um very interesting conversation and and I was just stuck to the, the thing written there and I was just uh, wondering what about the artist community because uh, we as an artist live in the gig economy for for forever we like we struggle for the livelihood and everything so whenever we talk about filmmakers there are a lot of camera people here sound people here musicians dancers I always miss uh, including them in in a conversation like this. So just I was just curious about the gig economy for Bharat for artists in India, uh, especially. Yeah. Shri, can I request to take the two or three other questions which are there, and then we can uh, conclude with. There's a question in the third row here, and one more in the front row. It was really wonderful listening to you. And uh, because since I'm getting this opportunity and we were having a discussion on uh, philanthropy, so I would just like to ask and at the same time uh, make small suggestion uh, that uh, people like you, do we have any, any plans like Sir told, uh, the team urban company offers some kind of health insurance and life insurance uh, for their uh, service providers. Do we have any kind of uh, such platform that offers any kind of educational scholarships? Yeah, do we have any such plans? But because uh, what I think, any service provider uh, who's working for you, just uh, there are two things that uh, seem to be very important. Is One is health and one is the education for the kids. So by making such kind of small uh, incentives and scholarships, maybe we help them in a greater sense in the future futuristic stuff. So if we have, so I would like to know, and if we do not, so it is just a small suggestion uh, that, because that, that doesn't, in, if we look in terms of capital, that doesn't look uh, too much to be invested upon, but that can actually bring a, a great change in the society. Thank you. I, hi, uh, thank you for the excellent discussion. Uh, I am uh, a co-founder of a company called Karma Life. We do, uh, we do to a uh, small ticket uh, recurring liquidity. We started there and we've been 
now you know doing 500 rupees a week to to uh, 2 lakh uh, a month type loans and we're moving to longer term credit as well i had a quick question so i think it was briefly mentioned that data you know work data is is key and we've actually proven in the last uh, two years of operation that uh, you know you can have a 5x uh, inclusion impact uh, based on uh, work data versus say just you know formal credit scores uh, so it begets the question uh, that for platforms uh, you 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 keep you store the data do you uh, i mean what is your thought around you know doing stuff yourself in terms of enabling these services versus working with specialized uh, you know innovative companies uh, because we we see both sides of the spectrum so i was just curious to know uh, what your thought process is in terms of uh, you know trying to uh, uh, work with uh, open your platforms to others to 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 work with you it's a wonderful discussion and you know it's a contradiction we say gig economy but i think these people are most in our lives we you know as guarantors sitting here we allow them in our houses and they solve our problems so i think the question always is what is their aspiration and like abhiraj mentioned you know why is it that the best people are not coming into the trainings in spite of having all the autonomy all the freedom so i've been in this skill space for the last uh, 15 to 16 years and we did have this question much earlier as well and there was a solution to a, to an extent that we had devised that was uh, you know with pizza hut we had worked with them very closely and while they give the ads out they said okay this is what you're going to join as in 6 months this is what your career path is and they did see a drastic change in the kind of people that enter the workforce whether it was the delivery uh, people or whether they were at the sales people so i think there is a question of aspiration for these because you know i have an occupational hazard at home and i ask them what's your next level and they don't have an answer so i think we need to get this out for them to get the best people into the skilling space thank you so much thank you and i think we did discuss that a bit about you know abhiraj talked about that progressive pathway and wealth creation and you know we are i think all saying we are not there yet but we want to but maybe these the other three questions on you know since you have so much data what's your thought on opening up that data for the benefit of many other uh, services or even worker benefits to build on top of that the question on scholarships for gig workers and uh, gig for artists answer the one uh, on the data uh, i think i agree that uh, as platforms we have data and we have the ability to structure and uh, analyze that data to uh, to you know uh, arrive at insights but when it comes to offering the services of credit or any other fin financial services or social security services uh, we would rather partner with uh, platforms such as yours because you know we believe that uh, your core uh, understanding of that space would would immensely help us so i think it is important that the ecosystem have both the partners working independently but collaborating uh, to make sure that the uh, better credit is given uh, you know to everyone who's uh, worthy of it so that's a an answer to that any responses for scholarships and uh, gig for artists you want to talk about it i think i can take the one on educational scholarships so i think there are a lot of platforms that are even giving um, you know skilling for free right now or micro courses for free there are offline skill centers which are made by the government which are also there but the problem over there that we've seen is a demand problem people join the skill centers but they don't complete the course they join these online courses but they don't complete the course so i think the problem is not only in access but it's also in retaining and completion so that people are actually getting skilled at the end of the entire journey which i think is a bigger problem to be solved for right now than giving something for free that how do you show people light at the end of the tunnel which is what you know someone else also spoke of so that they actually complete that entire phase and move ahead in life gig uh, i think isme to bahut zyada kaam hua hai and artist uh, mixed with the gig plus digital has uh, got benefited a lot with this entire evolution of last four five years or six years because any form of art uh, pretty much i'm thinking allowed uh, music video photography is very digital uh, friendly uh, format 
uh, and with the smartphones pretty much becoming so powerful that it is becoming a mini computer in itself uh, and then put on top of it platforms like Facebook, Insta, uh, there's a lot, entry barrier has gone significantly down for artists. Uh, a lot of businesses getting generated uh, uh, in the form of gig uh, for all the artists. So for artists, there's a l l big change uh, if we compare it with a 10 year, uh, uh, if we take a 10 year time frame, it's a big change for artists uh, with these changes. Thank you, thank you so much all of you for coming here, sharing your thoughts, insights, engaging in this conversation. I've taken back a lot of notes for myself on what we can do more as the foundation because we have a strong belief in the role that gig economy can play in uh, not just meaningful work, but you know progressive work and, and still a lot of distance for us to cover. But thank you so much and thanks for listening in and asking your questions. Mm -hmm.